Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 23rd, 2019, and this is part 14 of my video series called The Mystery of the Beast. Today's title is The Mark of the Beast. And you have to bear with me today because today I think is going to be a very long video. I don't know how long, but I feel like I need to get through a lot of information um, because I, I think that the next video is going to be where I finally reveal what the Lord showed me just before he told me to be quiet for nine months. And that was over a year ago now. Um, and I have not revealed this to anyone else that I know of except for my wife. And I think it will be in the next video. But there's some ground we have to cover first. It's important really for all of you to watch the previous videos because what I've done in the previous videos is to give you a doctrinal foundation for what is coming next. What I'm going to be saying is going to be extremely hard to believe and it's going to throw a lot of people's doctrine into chaos and um, a lot of people will not know what to do with it. That's why I have tried to be pretty meticulous with going through some foundational doctrines, foundational ideas with respect to the Bible itself and with understanding the scripture. Today, the mark of the beast, of course, is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible, as is almost everything in the book of Revelation, and for good reason, as I have previously discussed in various ways. You know, there's, all of you have probably heard this before, but when a person learns to identify counterfeit money, I've always heard that that person is always trained in real money first. He learns about all the aspects of real money so that he can quickly and easily identify counterfeit money or false money. I'm going to follow that same approach today with respect to explaining the mark of the beast. Now, there's a couple of introductory ideas I want to talk about. One of them is dealing with the Hebrew letters Aleph Tav, the first and the last letters. This Bible, the Eth Sefer, is something I really recommend because it's written in a way to include the Aleph Tav, those letters where they occur in the scripture. And I want to read you just a little bit from the last page of the introduction concerning that. One Hebrew word which has escaped translation in all English texts is the word eth, E-T-H, which is spelled in the Hebrew as aleph tav, two letters. The aleph is the ox head, the symbol of strength and is often construed as a crown of leadership. And the Tav is an X or a cross, and it means the mark. Now, I find this really interesting that today as I went to prepare for this, that that letter Tav actually means mark, because today's video is the mark of the beast. The Aleph Tav combination stands 9,392 times in the Hebrew Old Testament and 460 times in the New Testament. Hebrew translation from the Greek translation, or the Greek, he says the Greek textus receptus, and does so in each instance without the benefit of translation. So it is our election, therefore, to include all of the Aleph Tavs that show up in the text of the Old Testament and the 460 times the Aleph Tav shows up in the Hebrew translation from the Greek Textus Receptus. Then he gives a couple of examples and I wanna give you each of those examples. The first one is this. 
Genesis 1.1 says this, In the beginning, Elohim, always translated God, created, and then you have Aleph Tav there, the heavens and Aleph Tav again, the earth. So that was Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and you have Aleph Tav occurring two times. Now remember, the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the Tav is the last letter. Well then, the SFR quotes this verse, John 1, verse 1, stating, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Aleph Tav, Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. John 1, verse 1. Then the next verse it quotes is, Revelation 1.8, where Jesus specifically says, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Aleph Tav. The beginning and the end says Yahuwah Elohim, which is and which was and which is to come. Yahuwah Saveat. So that's Revelation 1.8. Jesus clearly identifies himself as God has God Almighty using, in fact, the word Elohim and Yahuwah there. So I wanted then to take us to Isaiah 46, verse 8. Remember this and stand firm. Call, recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east. The man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. So here, God specifically says that he has declared the end from the beginning. So what we're going to do today is we are going to look at the mark of God and how God described that from the very beginning of his revelation to men, which was written by the prophet Moses. And we're going to see what he says about his mark before we can look into what the mark of the beast is. So we are going to look at the real before we look at the counterfeit. First, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to read the entire chapter because it's so important with respect to this idea. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, before I go further, I want to show you, I'm using Bible Gateway on uh, the internet, BibleGateway.com, Deuteronomy 6, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you don't like that version, you can go and pick out many different versions, you know, the King James Version, if that's what you like, and many other ones. So I often compare one version with another for accuracy and interpretation. Now, verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Of course, Jesus quoted this verse when he taught the people. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. That is the goal. That is God's goal. His word shall be on our heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children 
and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now this is a simple verse, but it it is overlooked by almost all Christians. And you have to wonder why. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You ought always to be talking about the word of God to your children. Not only that, if your children are all gone, then you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. In other words, when you and your wife are talking, don't sit down and get in front of the television. Don't just turn on the radio and blast yourselves out with the latest uh, baseball game, football game, or whatever else it is. Also, when you sit down at table to eat, talk about the Word. Tell each other, what, is, what has God been showing you? That's what my wife and I do all the time. And God has given us progressive revelation, understanding in this idea, this teaching that is coming forth right now. We will literally, God will show me something in a day, maybe in the morning when I first read the word, and then I'll share that with my wife. She might have something new to share with it, but I I will also then talk to her about new things in order to get a a confirmation, in order that the Lord himself can confirm what he is showing me. We always need to be circumspect. We always need to be aware that we can be deceived, that we can be wrong about something. We have to take it very seriously. Let's not be presumptuous and let's not just think that we're it. Oh man, God has anointed me to do something, to say something, to be something. Because God is no respecter of persons. If I don't get it right, then I'm accountable. God says that he will hold the teacher more accountable than the one who is not a teacher of the word of God. So I take this responsibility very seriously. So I talk about these things all the time with my wife. I talk of them when I sit in my house. And I talk of them when I walk on the way. When my wife and I go on walks, we talk about the Word of God. When we drive somewhere toward a destination that may take us an hour or so in the vehicle, we will talk about the Word of God. Often, Our one son that still lives at home with us will be with us when we discuss these things so that he himself has an understanding of of things of the word because he's there and he's privy to our conversation. But not only that, think about the word when you lie down, when you go to bed often. What I'll do, especially if I cannot sleep, I'll just begin to pray and I'll begin to ask the Lord to give me wisdom and understanding into certain scriptures that I've read and things that I want to know, things that I need for the Holy Spirit to explain to me. And then the first thing that I do when I rise up in the morning is that I read the Word of God. And so, for many years, many years, this has been a staple of my life. You shall teach the words that I command you. You shall teach the word of God diligently to your children. You shall talk of the word of God when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is where so many go wrong, where they take the scripture, the meaning of it, and then they make it into a law that is meaningless. For example, the Pharisees had what were called phylacteries. They would make these leather pouches and they would put them on their foreheads and they would bind them on their wrists. And inside of those little pouches, they would put tiny little verses of scriptures And they believed that they were fulfilling the scripture by binding the written word on their hand and by binding the written word as frontlets on their foreheads or between their eyes. What is God saying here? 
my word you shall bind as a sign on your hand means you shall do it. You shall do with your hands what I teach you in my word. And what are these frontlets between my eyes? What is between my eyes, my mind, my brain? Know the word of God. Understand the word of God. When you understand it and you put it in your mind, you put it in your brain as frontlets between your eyes, then your brain will guide your hands to do his word. That's what he's talking about here. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's something we did not do for a long time, but in these later years, the last 10 years or so, we have put the word of God inside our house, around our doorposts, and also on gates to our land. So that it is very clear where we stand, and also we then remember the word when we look at the at what we have written on our doorposts and upon our gates. Now for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and go down to verse 20 here. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now this is prophetic, and Pharaoh is as Satan to us today. And those of us who know the Lord, understand that before we knew the Lord and walked with the Lord, we were slaves to Satan. We were slaves to sin. Verse 22, And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. The New Testament writers make it very clear that we are to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They also make it very clear that we are no longer under the law. It's no longer by a strict observance of all of the statutes of the law. And that would include the many food prohibitions, the way to dress, the way to cut your beard, the way to sacrifice animals, and so on. We are not under those laws. The way to celebrate a holiday, the way to celebrate even the Sabbath. Paul makes it clear that we are not under those laws. But yet, when it comes to the moral laws, do not lie, do not kill, do not st steal, do not commit adultery, all of those are in effect we all have an obligation to live a moral life. And we're going to go into some of the scriptures that make that abundantly clear soon. So I want people to, to understand where I'm at as we go with this and not be confused and think I'm trying to put you back under the law. But I am trying to get you to understand what the mark of God is. Now this scripture I just read from you to you from Deuteronomy 6 is also reiterated in Deuteronomy 11. Verse 18 it says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children 
talking of them when you were sitting in your house and when you were walking by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. That was the promise and the natural to Israel. The promise is also for us, for those who willingly obey Jesus our Lord now. And we will do these exploits. The time is coming and is very soon when we will drive out those who have done evil, when we will sit in judgment of those who have done evil. Now let's look at some other verses that deal with with this idea. We'll go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love is mercy. Faithfulness is truth. Mercy and truth. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Okay? Make them a part of you. Remember them. Do them. Remember them and do them. Then Proverbs chapter 6. We would go down to around verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. How so? to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Well, we read this and we think, oh, well, I don't commit adultery, you know, so this doesn't really apply to me. Think prophetically. Who is the adulteress in Scripture? And this is where we're coming in the next videos. The adulteress is Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great, who seduced the entire earth with her sexual immorality and drove the world crazy, drove the world into madness. And that's where the world is today. How else do you describe transsexual activity? What in the world is that? Babylon the Great has driven the world mad with its sexual immorality. And we would have been saved from it if we would have kept the commands of God in our mind and we would have done the commands of God with our hands. But we didn't. And now the entire world is in slavery to Babylon the Great. Then Proverbs chapter 7. See how simple it is just to go to places in this BibleGateway.com. Verse 1, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words to keep you out of Babylon the Great. Why, did, why does God say so often, come out of her, my people? Do you realize it's in at least four different places in the Bible where God says, come out of her, my people. And he's speaking to Babylon the Great. And why? Because God's people are in the harlot. 
And they're in the harlot now. And they're refusing to come out so far. They're holding on to sin. They're holding on to false doctrine. They're fighting against the truth. They're fighting against the commandments of God. God's commands when written upon your heart will keep you from the adulteress, will keep you from Jezebel, will keep you from Babylon the Great. Let's go to Psalm 37. And we'll look at verse 31. Psalm 37, 31. 30 and 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart, and his steps do not slip. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 51. And we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. I'll start at verse 4. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. He's talking to us. This does not apply only to Israel 2,700 years ago. This speaks to us now. Give attention to, my, give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, we are God's nation, and we're known by the name of Israel. The overcomers of God are Israel. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. This has not happened yet. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes. To the heavens and look to the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Those are the only people who know God's righteousness. The law must be written in your heart. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in days of old, the generations of long ago. This is the time of the awakening of the Lord. Now let's go to Jeremiah 31. Everyone believes that these last 2,000 years have been the years of the new covenant. But you know what? Most people, most people who said they were Christians did not even come into the new covenant. How do I know? Because the law was never written on their hearts. Look what happens in the new covenant. Deuteronomy 31 verses 33 to 34. It's even said, look at this, the new covenant. The new covenant has not yet begun, brothers and sisters. It has not begun. This time, this last 2,000 years, has only been the time of selecting the overcomers, has been the time of preparing those who are going to rule in the world during the time of the new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. See, Israel and Judah have not yet come together. They are still at odds. Israel, prophetically, are Christians. Judah, prophetic, Judah are the Jews. The Jews have not yet embraced their Messiah. They have not embraced the new covenant yet. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with them 
with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will do it. God says, I will do it. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Has that happened? Why am I teaching now? It has not happened. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And that's not the only place that this occurs. Let's look now at Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel, where all the nations are destroyed, including Judah and Israel. And then they shall know that I am the Lord when they're destroyed, because destruction means the destruction of our flesh, the destruction of the old man. And when our old man is destroyed, then we will know that God is the Lord, and then we will embrace his law, his way, his righteousness. Ezekiel 36. Verses 26 and 27. Again, this has not yet happened. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from your idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. When the law of God is written upon our hearts, we walk according to God's statutes as a matter of course, because it is our life. That's what we love. That's what our mind is set upon when his law is written upon our hearts. Now let's look at Ezekiel chapter 9. Very profound scripture titled, Idolaters Killed. Let's start with verse 1. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. This is God leaving his people because of disobedience. Serious. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. Do you sigh and groan over the abominations committed in your world? Do you sigh and groan over the abominations committed in your city, in your family, in your church? This is the mark of God. And God commands his angels 
to mark his people. And to the others he said in my hearing, pass through the city after them, after him, and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. Touch no one on whom is my mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Begin with those people who are called by my name, but have rebelled against me, who will have nothing to do with my ways, will have nothing to do with my law, nothing to do with my commandments, nothing to do with my statutes, who will not listen to my ways. Start there. He tells the angel of destruction. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Then he said to me, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking and I was left alone, I fell upon my face and cried, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? Do you sigh and groan over the abominations committed around you? Then God said to me, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. This land of America, this world, the guilt of this world is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen with the writing case at his waist brought back words saying, I have done as you commanded me. let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. To the church in Philadelphia, a faithful church, one of the only faithful churches, really faithful, who had but little power, but they kept God's word and did not deny his name. In that church, to the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers, the overcomers are conquerors. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. This is the mark of God. God marks his overcomers with his name, with the name of his city, with Christ's own new name. Then let's go to Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. The seal. A seal marks things. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 144,000 is the number of the overcomers. All of the overcomers are sealed with the mark of God. 
this time that we have lived through, this 2,000 years that the book of Revelation deals with is the time of the sealing of the overcomers. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. God's people are marked and sealed, and they are protected from demonic onslaught. The demons will not touch us. They will not touch us. They cannot touch us. Revelation 14. Verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. And with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Notice that this is the very seal that he promised to the overcomers in the church of Philadelphia. His name, his new name, and the father's name written on his forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Again, the number 144,000. They are the ones sealed, and they're the ones who have the new song. No one can learn it but them. Do you know what the song is? It's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. They have learned the lesson of both the law and grace. They understand truth. Because the law tells us what truth is. And they have understood mercy because Jesus has shown us what mercy is. So they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. They can judge perfectly because they understand their own frailty in the flesh. But they also understand the righteousness of God because God's law has been written on their hearts. God's law is on their hands. They do what the Lord would have them do. God's law is on their mind because they think about, they meditate upon his law, his commands, his ways. So they have fulfilled what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. They have written the law on their heads and on their hands. They know them and they walk in them. They do them. They teach them. Then Revelation 22. The mark is all over, isn't it? 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the, fruit, the tree of life and its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God, and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Here again is the mark. And night will be no more. 
They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. He's describing the He's describing New Jerusalem, which is comprised of the overcomers. The stones, the precious stones that make up New Jerusalem are the individual overcomers who make it up. They are the trees. Their leaves are for the healing of the nations. That's what the millennium is for. That's what's coming, is the healing of the nations. Because the, the nations have been defiled and destroyed by millennia of wickedness. So now that we know what the true mark is, what is the false mark? Let's look at Revelation 13 where it's introduced. First look at the context. The context is within the beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It's a false prophet. The false prophet that we see in our churches performing great signs, all kinds of spiritual signs people think is, are happening and they're false. The signs deceive all those who dwell on the earth. Telling, it, telling them to make an image for the beast. Our churches are images of the beast. Our churches are places of defilement because we don't follow the ways of God. We make images of the beast that look like Satan. The beast himself looks like Satan. The image of the beast looks like Satan. That's why this beast from the earth speaks like a dragon. But he tries to fool you because he wants to look like a lamb with little bitty horns. One of the great themes of all scripture is that God's plan, God's plan is to make man in his image. And Satan's, and we are made into his image when the law of God is perfectly written upon our hearts. Satan's plan is to make a counterfeit image. He makes an image of himself. Notice that it's the second beast who causes people to make the image of the beast to worship. And... And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. The, the beast seems alive. So that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. You know, we think our churches are alive. People who are so mistaken, so debauched, believe that their religious beast, their image of the beast, their image of Satan is alive. And they slay those who don't worship their image. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, after this teaching, do you have wisdom? Are you still looking for some kind of a mark here? Are you still looking for some kind of a mark here? Are you still looking for what the, the old Pharisees did? Some physical mark? Or are you beginning to think spiritually, prophetically? The mark has always been with us. The mark of the beast has always been with us. The question is, what are you marked with? 
What mark do you have? Test yourself. Oh, you want to test? Okay, let's go. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Let's see. Let's just see what the mark of the beast is. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Set your mind on the things of God, on his commandments, his ways, his righteousness. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory, speaking to those who who are doing this, who are setting their minds on the things of God. So, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, isn't that interesting? Earthly in you. Earthly. Earthly. Where did I hear that word before? Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Now, let's see what a beast rising out of the earth might look like. What is earthly? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Number one, sexual immorality. You know an evil church when they allow any type of sexual immorality. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Your lust for things. You lust for things, lust for things, idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Oh, is that all that is earthly or of the earth? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. Well, in these you once, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Obscene talk. Do you tell dirty jokes? Do you sit around and laugh and, and listen to dirty jokes? Do you want to hear dirty jokes? What do you watch? What kind of shows do you watch? Movies, television. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with its practices and have put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then Paul helps us here. He says, so you're going to put off all these things that are earthly, all these marks of earthliness, all these marks of the beast. You're going to put off all these marks and put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive, and you must forgive. Stop harbor, harboring that bitterness in your heart, that unforgiveness. Someone made you mad a long time ago, and you never forgave them. And you expect to get to heaven. What do you think Jesus is going to say? You didn't forgive such and such. I'm not going to forgive you. You've got to forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, the commandments, as we learned in Deuteronomy 6, teaching and admonishing one another, talking about it as you were on the way, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.
So now we see what is earthly. Those earthly things, all of these evil things that we see here in Colossians 3, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and we could add many things. Does he have in here, for example, theft, drunkenness? He does have lying, okay? These are the marks of the beast. These are the marks of the earthly beast. Remember that Satan is described in Revelation 12. Then the beast that rises from the sea is described in Revelation chapter 13. They look identical. The beast you've learned now is man. So man, the beast, looks like Satan. And then you have false religion coming along. And he creates an image that looks like Satan too. And now we learned that all these things are the characteristics of Satan. Characteristics of the earthly, of the flesh. Now the mark of the beast, everybody thinks 666 is going to be marked on your hand. People have been looking forever for someone whose name comes to 666 to try to come up with who the Antichrist is. But what is it? What does 666 represent? Man, man was created on the sixth day. The beasts of the field were created on the sixth day. Satan, one of the beasts of the field, the most clever of the beasts of the field, was created on the sixth day. Man, beast, Satan. Six, six, six. The mark of the beast is when you identify as a beast with Satan. That is the mark of the beast. We only have two options. Either we have the mark of the beast or we have the mark of God. Now, is it written anywhere in Scripture that the mark of the beast is an unforgivable sin? I don't see it. Jesus said there was one unforgivable sin. Do you remember what that was? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is? Calling good evil and calling evil good. We see that all the time now. There are many, many people who have now been revealed who have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They routinely call evil good and good evil. They call abortion a good thing. They call the surgical changing of sexes a good thing. They call killing Donald Trump a good thing. They call ridiculing a young 16-year-old boy with a MAGA hat, a good thing. They call sex with children a good thing. They call sacrificing children to Satan, to Moloch, to Baal, a good thing. They call eating those children a good thing. They call evil good. And they call us evil. They call good people 
who want to obey God, evil. They've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But everyone has taken the mark of the beast until you repent of it, until you put it off. Put off the old man. Put off the old, the old man is the beast. Put off the old man. It's what Paul says here. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. You have put on the new man. That word self is man. They're trying to be politically correct here. They don't want to, they don't want to be discriminatory to females. The word is man. We are either in the old man, Adam, or we're in the new man, Christ. We are in the beast of the beast, or we are in Jesus Christ. So now we have a choice to make. Are we going to continue in the ways of the beast, in the ways of the flesh, in the ways of the earth? Or are we going to put to death what is earthly in us? <clears throat> These are lessons that we must learn. Things are heating up. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Amen.